This is lecture 9 video. We're going to cover skeletal muscle cells. The learning objectives are shown here and it covers everything from the organization of muscle to electrical impulses to muscle contraction as well as ATP production. First we're going to distinguish between the types of muscle that we see in the body. We see three different types of muscle tissue and muscle cells in our body. Skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is uh, usually found in our hollow organs like our stomach and our bladder and our blood vessels. Cardiac muscle is only found in the heart and skeletal muscle are all those muscles in your leg and your back and your core and your arms that you use uh, voluntarily to walk around, stand up. So the urinary bladder is a good example of smooth muscle and of course the heart is cardiac muscle. So when our brain sends signals down, they'll send electrical impulses through nerves to control our skeletal muscle. And you might be surprised that skeletal muscle is the only voluntar voluntary control you have in your body. Uh, we can do things like move our limbs, facial expressions, speak or breathe, and that's all voluntary muscle. Uh, cardiac muscle and smooth muscle are involuntary, meaning that our brain might control them or local signals might control them. Uh, but we don't consciously control those. So lower brain centers or local control or hormonal control uh, will, will affect things like cardiac and smooth muscle. We also may call that autonomic control from time to time, okay, compared to voluntary control of skeletal muscle. Early in your development, the skeletal myocytes or skeletal muscle cells are actually created by the fusion of many, 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 maybe thousands of myoblasts. And these myoblasts will fuse to create this very large cell. So that's why skeletal muscle cells appear uh, multinucleated. They have multiple nuclei because they came from these many founding cells. Skeletal muscle cells have a lot of names, fibers, myocytes, myofibers. So please don't let that confuse you. On a microscope, you can actually see these striations or these stripes on skeletal myocytes. And that has to do with the pattern of actin and myosin, which are the contractile proteins of our muscle cells. And those are muscle proteins for contraction. Skeletal myocytes shown here with the other types of myocytes. So we'll show cardiac myocytes. Cardiac myocytes are a lot smaller and they're not really drawn in proportion here, but they're much, much smaller. They have a single nucleus. Um, again, skeletal muscle is controlled by a neuron. That neuron has to send a signal down to your skeletal muscle, release a chemical signal such as acetylcholine in order for it to contract. If you ever have nerve injury, your little muscle cell will no longer get a signal and it will not contract. Compare that with cardiac myocytes. Cardiac myocytes act as pacemakers, so they're able to actually initiate their own contractile activity. Uh, so they can contract all by themselves, independent of the brain. But the brain does send neural control signals down to the cardiac muscle cells to speed them up, slow them down, or have them contract with more force. So again, if you didn't have a nervous supply to your heart, it would still contract. Those little myocytes would still contract. They just wouldn't be able uh, to speed up or slow down uh, when the brain wants them to. Smooth muscle cells, they're kind of like cardiac muscle cells in that they have some independent pacemaker ability. Um, they also are able to um, contract on their own once in a while. We usually don't call smooth muscle cells myocytes for some reason, but it's okay if you do. Um, but usually we'll just call them smooth muscle cells, or maybe you might want to call them smooth muscle myocytes. So again, there is, they have some pacemaker ability. They also respond to local signals. They don't have striations. Um, because they have actin and myosin, but the actin and myosin is not arranged the same way as cardiac and skeletal muscle. So all of these cells have actin and myosin as their contractile proteins, only you don't see the striations in the smooth muscle cells. Okay, so obviously actin and my myosin is something you're going to need to remember. Contractile proteins of all muscle cells are actin and myosin skeletal and cardiac, you'll actually see the striations. And this is actually a cardiac muscle cell, cardiac myocyte, showing you uh, what it looks like when it contracts. And they'll contract by themselves and they're in, uh, in culture. They don't need any signals from the brain.
I want to talk a little bit about the bladder as an example of involuntary control. So most of us would say, well, wait a second, I control when I urinate and I control when I pee. So I wanted to make sure it's clear how you actually have that control. So our smooth muscle of our bladder is controlled by our brain and our spinal cord, and that's involuntary control. But you actually have control of a sphincter, a skeletal muscle ring that goes around your urethra, and that skeletal muscle is controlled by you voluntarily. So when you decide you want to pee, you can actually send signals to relax that skeletal muscle. When you relax that skeletal muscle, that initiates involuntary reflex contraction uh, and control of your bladder, which causes uh, contraction and the urine is pushed out. So sometimes it's complex with a combination of skeletal muscle maybe under your control, but then the bladder here under smooth muscle involuntary control. And we'll learn more about that. Okay, a note on striations. I just wanted to make sure we're clear. What actually causes those striations is this sort of pattern of actin and myosin, which are the proteins that allow for muscle contraction. We can break it down to the most simple unit of contraction inside our muscle cells is a sarcomere, which is basically a repeating pattern of this actin and myosin. And if you look inside that cell, you shrink down that little actin and myosin and look on a microscope and you can actually see uh, those little proteins from far away cause the striping or striations. We'll talk more about that, but it's just actin and myosin inside the cells, contractile proteins. Overview, function of skeletal muscle, obviously moving our bones, helping our posture, guarding entrance, entrances like our eyes and our lips. Uh, supporting soft tissues. Body temperature, we might not think about that a lot, but your cells, all the cells of your body produce heat, and since muscle cells can be very active, they'll produce heat. We'll also talk a little bit about nutrient reserve. So one thing to remember is that all chemical reactions create some heat. So um, chemical reactions going on inside our body to make ATP, inside the mitochondria to make ATP, will generate some heat. And all cells, not just skeletal muscle, but all cells generate heat. It's just we notice that heat when we uh, use a lot of muscle activity. It heats up our body and we begin to sweat. One thing I wanted to mention, if you're, if you're really, really starved of nutrients, you can actually start to break down all that actin and myosin protein inside your muscle cells. It's a great reserve. You don't usually want to use it, but if you need to, you can. You can break down those proteins to amino acids. The amino acids can go to our cells in our body to make ATP in the mitochondria. Of course, your muscles will atrophy if that's the case. I want to talk a little bit about the organization and structure of our skeletal muscle uh, all the way down to the cellular level. So muscles are basically meat. And so if you've ever seen a steak, you've seen muscle. It's a lot of connective tissue supporting a bunch of muscle cells uh, or myocytes. We might even have uh, blood vessels going in there and nerves. They're not easy to see, but they're in there supporting the muscle and, and nourishing the muscle and controlling the muscle. Uh, we might even have some adipose tissue around there uh, to cushion the muscle. So remember, connective tissue is just mainly collagen, maybe a little bit of elastin. Uh, and so we have lots of myocytes, some collagen, some elastin, even some fat around our muscle. And then, of course, all that connective tissue sort of winds down and braids into a tendon and connects that muscle to uh, often bone. Okay, we're going to look at the organization for the typical muscle. So again, we'll start at the, the cell level, also called a fiber or a myocyte. So whenever we say muscle fiber, we meet a cell. Each little fiber has a little bit of support connective tissue that extends all the way from tendon to tendon. When we bundle a bunch of muscle cells together, or fibers, we call that a muscle fascicle. So we're bundling a bunch of cells together, a bunch of fibers together. We're surrounding it with some protective connective tissue called paramyceum. So again, this is called a fascicle. A fascicle is a bundle of muscle fibers, cells. Okay, and each fascicle has some supporting paramyceum connective tissue, which extends all the way to the tendon. So that's kind of how you anchor your cells to the tendons through this connective tissue. And if we looked at the biceps brachii, we would see that there would be maybe dozens of these fascicles. So we're just putting a bunch of fascicles in our muscle. Each fascicle represents a bundle of cells, and it would have some supporting connective tissue.
our entire muscle is simply a bundle of fascicles and that entire muscle is surrounded by some very dense connective tissue called epimysium. Epimysium is connective tissue which will also extend all the way to the tendon and so the tendon becomes a braiding of the paramysium, the epimysium, and the other connective tissue. So again we look a muscle is just a bunch of fascicles and fascicles are bundles of individual fibers and how many fibers or muscle cells in a in a muscle maybe a hundred thousand maybe more and you're welcome to pause on this and get a little better definition of each of those if we zoom in this is a cartoon version I just wanted to make sure you see that there's connective tissue supporting our muscle fibers uh, there's gonna be fibroblasts to build that there's blood vessels their nerves uh, the blood vessels obviously support and nourish those muscle cells. They're very active, so they're going to need often oxygen, uh, glucose, and nutrients producing CO2 that will need to be taken away. So we'll have arteries and veins and capillaries in there in our muscle, usually going through the connective tissue. Muscles, muscle fibers are basically cells. So we've already learned the typical cell and a muscle cell is a really specialized cell to contract. So uh, it's got a lot of the same parts as a typical cell, like a mitochondria. It's got a nucleus, actually has several nuclei. The ER is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum in muscle cells. And so sometimes we just call it the SR. Its job is to store calcium. So it's a calcium storage site. Then we pack our, our muscle cells with myofibrils, which are basically tiny little bundles of actin and myosin protein that are able to allow for contraction. So I would almost consider those cytoskeleton proteins inside our muscle cell, and they're specialized for contraction. They'll allow that muscle cell to change its uh, size, basically, pull on the tendons and cause muscle contraction. The cell membrane of muscle cells is called the sarcolemma. So it's kind of just new vocabulary uh, for things we've already learned. So if you hear sarcolemma, just think cell membrane. There's little indentations or tunnels in the um, sarcolemma or cell membrane called T-tubules. We can talk more about that. So if you look at a muscle cell, again, we've got intracellular and extracellular fluid. We've got those same ions we've learned, a lot of sodium chloride outside the cells, a lot of potassium inside the cells. Muscle cells are pretty neat that they have calcium stored inside their sarcoplasmic reticulum. Again, that's just the fancy way for saying ER or endoplasmic reticulum for a muscle cell. The myofibrils are interior little bundles of actin and myosin protein again inside the muscle cell packed in there are tons and tons of these myofibrils the myofibrils are made of actin and myosin so if we zoomed in on it one myofibril we'd actually see sort of that striation or banding pattern due to these thicker myosin uh, proteins and these thinner actin proteins sometimes they're called filaments so again these are the proteins that allow your muscle cell to contract each little unit of the, the myofibril is called a sarcomere, and it's just a repeating pattern, so people like to name stuff, so they call that the sarcomere. So you'd have literally hundreds, maybe thousands, I'm not sure, myofibrils packed inside of each myocyte. The more myofibrils you have, the stronger your muscle will be, right? The more myofibrils, the bigger your muscle will be, the more force it will generate. So when you work out, you'll have more myofibrils, you'll have a stronger muscle. Again, these are some textbook drawings of that same stuff. A myofibril made up of a sarcomere. The sarcomere is just made, basically made up of actin and myosin uh, filaments or strands. And those contract and they relax. And that causes your muscle to contract and relax. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is the cellular basis of electrical impulses in neurons and muscle cells. So you've probably always heard before that your body has electrical impulses, the brain, muscles, the heart. So we're going to talk about what that actually means at the cellular level. So those electrical impulses are going to be important not only for the neuron to tell our muscle cell to contract, but for the muscle cell to actually contract as well. So electrical impulses, if you broke it down to the most simple form, is really just going to be ions which are charged moving into or out of our cells. 
So sometimes we'll have sodium rush into our cell, and sometimes we'll have potassium rush out of our cell, and that will help change the charge inside our cells, and that's an electrical impulse. Um, they're really cool because they spread really fast and they signal really fast, and we call those electrical impulses action potentials. So if you hear action potential, now that means electrical impulse for you. Okay, so we're going to learn some basics about the cell charge and learn how these electrical impulses take place. The first thing to know is that our little muscle cells and really all the cells of our body have a bunch of potassium ion channels, plasma membrane proteins uh, embedded in the, mem in the membrane and those little channels allow potassium to diffuse out of the cell. So remember potassium is high inside the cell so it likes to leave through those open channels. When potassium leaves because it's positively charged, the inside of the cell is a little bit negative compared to the outside of the cell. Again, because potassium's positive, it leaves. We can actually detect, if we stab our little cell and actually put a voltmeter in there, we can actually measure this charge inside the cell. And again, because potassium left, we actually measure a negative charge on the inside, say minus 60 millivolts or minus 80 millivolts. So it's a tiny little charge, but it's important enough that it's going to help the cells work. And this is uh, probably found in most all cells in the body, have some negative uh, charge or voltage on the inside of our cells. Now I didn't want you to think that all the potassium leaves. Actually, very few potassium ions have to leave to create this charge or this voltage. Um, say there's billions of potassium and only a few million leave. And then also remember that we have those little pumps that can pump that potassium back in. All right, so some potassium leaves, we pump a little bit back, but enough of it leaves to create this negative charge. The small negative charge or voltage has a name, and sometimes it's called the membrane potential. I like to call it the membrane voltage. The term membrane potential comes from physics and talking about a separation of charge. So don't be surprised if your book and me say membrane voltage and membrane potential. All right, how did it come about? Negative on the inside due to potassium leaving the cells. A little bit of sodium may leak into our cells through a sodium channel, but such a small amount of sodium enters that it really doesn't affect the membrane charge that much. And then we also know that we have those sodium, potassium, ATPase pumps which will pump the sodium back out and pump some of the potassium back in and keep your cell happy and that would be like cellular homeostasis. So that's the resting membrane voltage or resting membrane potential negative on the inside of your cell. So where do these action potentials come in? Well action potentials come in when we open a bunch of sodium channels all of a sudden. So remember you're negative at rest inside your cell. If we open sodium channels, sodium likes to rush in because of diffusion, and when sodium rushes in, it's positive. And now we have a bunch of positive charge rushing into our cells, and the inside of our cell actually becomes more positive. So it actually shifts away from being negative on the inside towards being positive. And if we stick our little voltmeter in there during an action potential, we'll actually measure the shift in the membrane charge or voltage going towards zero and then going positive. And sometimes it'll even reach a positive, say, 35 value or positive 40 value. All of that was due to sodium rushing into the cell. Again, not all the sodium rushes in. Out of the billions and billions of sodium ions out there, only a few million rush in, but enough to change the charge from negative to positive. And that's basically an action potential. And then if you're wondering, how do I get back to the resting value? Well, those sodium channels close and sodium stops coming in. And remember, the little pump will pump some of that sodium out. But more importantly, the most important thing to get back to your resting value is to have potassium leave the cell because that's what made it negative in the first place. So those little potassium channels are open or more of them might open up. Potassium leaves your cell because potassium is positive it causes the inside of the cell to be slightly negative. So now we're back at rest, so our action potential now has ended. So that's an action potential. So again, don't forget those little pumps, the ATP pumps, will pump the sodium out and pump some of the potassium back in to help keep um, sodium from building up in the cell and too much potassium from leaving the cell. Okay. So over time, if we measure that membrane 
voltage, we can actually see it. It'll spike. It, well, at rest, it's negative. And then during an action potential, it spikes up positive very quickly and then very rapidly goes right back to negative. And so action potentials occur very quickly. And they spread very fast, so that positive charge spreads through the entire cell very quickly, and cells are going to use those to signal. One of the things you might want to uh, might want to know is how does an action potential start? Like, what triggers it in the first place? Well, again, neurons and myocytes both have action potentials. In skeletal myocytes, it's a chemical that will trigger it, and we call those chemicals released by neurons neurotransmitters. In the case of skeletal muscle, that chemical is almost always acetylcholine. In the case of neurons, what starts an action potential will be a chemical, again, a, a neurotransmitter. It could be acetylcholine or dopamine or serotonin. What happens is that chemical triggers an increase in entry of calcium or sodium or any positive ion into the cell. And when the inside of the cell becomes positive, it triggers an action potential. If we look at sensory neurons, we can see lots of things can trigger an action potential. Uh, again, remember the inside of our cell is normally negative, but you could have a pain signal or a smell chemical or a pain chemical or maybe just your neuron becomes cold and that will cause sodium or sometimes calcium to rush into your neuron and that will trigger the action potential. And we'll learn more about that with the nervous system, but I just wanted to give you the idea that lots of things can trigger action potentials in your neurons from chemicals to actual physical touch to temperature uh, and that will cause an action potential and then usually the neuron will release a chemical and that chemical will have some effect in your body. Okay, so, and we'll talk more about neurons. They have these long axons, these long extensions. One of the things we're going to talk about is the end of a neuron is called an axon terminal. And in the case of controlling skeletal muscle, those axon terminals have stored acetylcholine in vesicles. And we call this a synapse. And since it's a communication between a neuron and a muscle cell, we call the synapse the neuromuscular junction. So imagine you have an excited neuron. Sodium rushes in, it's positive charge. That triggers the opening of calcium channels. Calcium rushes in. That causes the exocytosis and release of that little trapped acetylcholine chemical in the vesicles. The acetylcholine diffuses across the synapse or the neuromuscular junction. And that triggers the little muscle cell to have an action potential, which causes the muscle cell then to contract. And we'll look at some of the steps. So one of the first things we need to recognize is that acetylcholine binds to an acetylcholine receptor, which is a membrane protein acting as a receptor. So it binds the little chemical acetylcholine that causes that membrane protein, that acetylcholine receptor, to open up. So it's actually a protein. It changes shape. When it opens, sodium rushes through it. And when sodium rushes into our little muscle cell, that's the beginning of our action potential. It causes a local change in the charge or voltage inside the muscle cell right there at the neuromuscular junction, which causes positive sodium to rush in. Well, what happens next? Well, there's nearby voltage-gated sodium channels, which again are just membrane proteins, but these little channels stay closed. The only time they open is when they sense positive charge inside the cell. Well, the acetylcholine receptor lets sodium in and that triggers these little voltage-gated uh, sodium channels to open up in a wave, almost like dominoes. And so sodium rushes in all throughout the cell, and that's basically our action potential. And it spreads like a wave super fast through the entire cell. Wherever there are voltage-gated sodium channels, they open up. They basically trigger each other because they respond to the positive charge. So again, this is how an action potential can spread in a wave. It's all due to these little voltage-gated uh, sodium channels. But the thing that started it was those acetylcholine receptors, which caused sodium to rush in, which caused more sodium to rush in, which caused more sodium to rush in. When we want to stop our action potential, those voltage-gated sodium channels start to close. They start to close just by their structure, and eventually they're all closed. When they're all closed, sodium stops rushing in, but now potassium can rush out through open channels. When potassium rushes out, the inside of our little muscle cell becomes negative again, 
and we're back at rest. So that's how an action potential occurs. Seems complicated, but really if you just think about ions rushing in and out, it's kind of simple. Now remember you have your little sodium ATPase, uh, sodium potassium ATP pumps, which will pump some of that sodium out and some of that potassium back in. Uh, you'll also remove the acetylcholine and basically uh, your little neuron will stop signaling and your muscle cell will relax. So if we look at a, a myocyte and a neuron, they're really, really long cells, very long. I mean, maybe feet long, several inches for sure, uh, if not longer. So how do we get these signals to spread down a really, really, really long cell? Really, all you have to do is put a bunch of these voltage-gated sodium channels all throughout the cell, all throughout the membrane, and one after the other. When one opens up, sodium rushes in, the positive charge triggers the next channel, which triggers the next channel, which triggers the next channel. And in that way, sodium rushes into our cell, causing the cell to become positive on the inside in a wave. And that is an action potential. And it always spreads very fast uh, in one direction or the other. And in the case of a muscle cell, it triggers contraction. In the case of a neuron, that wave of positivity, that wave of sodium rushing in, is going to cause an action potential. And maybe it's going to carry a pain signal from your fingertip all the way back to your spinal cord, where that little neuron might release a chemical. And that chemical might trigger a, a secondary neuron, which relays that signal from your spinal cord up to your brain. So that's how neurons use those action potentials to, to signal very quickly. And again, it always involves action potentials, and then in the case of neurons, maybe uh, a chemical. Sodium rushes in, potassium rushes out. So easy, if you can just remember that. OK, the next learning objective we've already started, but we're going to continue to explain the control of skeletal muscle by neurons at the neuromuscular junction. And it kind of surprises me that it only takes two neurons to carry a signal from your brain down to your spinal cord, release a chemical, stimulate another neuron, which goes out to your skeletal muscle that you consciously control, which releases acetylcholine and causes your muscle to contract. So only two neurons to control your muscles in your face, in your arms, even way down in your legs. And it's very fast. The action potentials are very fast. Otherwise, it wouldn't be uh, a very useful process for us. If you ever have a spinal cord injury or a nerve injury that blocks the nerves that control your muscles, then your muscles will not have a signal to contract. And so they will not contract. They'll basically just sit there. Uh, they'll be paralyzed. And so um, that's why spinal cord injuries are so devastating, because now you're not controlling your muscles anymore. Okay, so one thing to remember, because these cells are so long, they only do have the one neuromuscular junction. Again, one communication from that neuron with that muscle cell, and that's a chemical communication using acetylcholine, which then triggers an action potential. All right, so one neuromuscular junction somewhere mid middle of that long, long myocyte, and each action potential in a neuron will cause a contraction in the myocyte. If you block acetylcholine, you would block contraction. If you block acetylcholine's removal, you would block relaxation. So we'll talk more about that. So it's all about nerves controlling our skeletal myocytes. So if we zoom in and look again at that little neuron axon terminal, which is the end of the neuron, if we look there, it has stored acetylcholine in these vesicles. And this is near our myocyte, so we call this the neuromuscular junction. We have sodium channels, we have calcium channels in our little neuron. When the neuron's excited, sodium rushes in. That triggers the entry of calcium into the end of that axon. This causes those vesicles to fuse with the membrane, which we call exocytosis. The exocytosis dumps out the acetylcholine into that synapse, or neuromuscular junction. The acetylcholine binds to this, this membrane protein called the acetylcholine receptor. That allows sodium to rush into the cell locally there at the neuromuscular junction. The inside of the cell there becomes very positive because of the sodium rushing in. When the inside becomes positive, that's going to help trigger those voltage-gated sodium channels that are also in the membrane nearby. Those little voltage-gated sodium channels will pop open 
due to the positive charge on the inside of the cell. Remember, at rest, it's normally negative, but now it's become positive. So one by one, those little voltage-gated sodium channels open up. Sodium rushes in, triggers the next set of channels, and our action potential spreads. And this happens seemingly instantaneously, but uh, we're slowing it down to learn. If you inject a person with Botox, botulinum toxin, how does that block muscle contraction? Well, what it does is it actually goes into that end of the neuron, and it actually blocks the exocytosis of acetylcholine. So when people get Botox injections, the acetylcholine can't get released, you can't stimulate your muscle, and your muscle is basically paralyzed. Your muscle can't work anymore. And you might say, well, what does that have to do with wrinkles? Well, if you paralyze your little muscles, and those little muscles are making the wrinkles, then you will not have wrinkles on your face. But remember, Botox is actually targeting the neurons, which control the muscles. So usually they inject it in the facial muscles, and it's really affecting the neuron endings in those muscles. And so again, if you paralyze those, it seems like it works for maybe a, a couple months. And so you can see some of the wrinkles there at the corners of the eyes. You inject with Botox, and that stuff's gone. Of course, it looks a little weird when people are you know, trying to smile, but their face is frozen because their little neurons can't release acetylcholine, and so their muscle cells can't contract. So it does get rid of wrinkles, but it also makes your face kind of frozen. Okay, I wanted to mention an important step in turning off acetylcholine signaling so that your muscle can relax. Remember, acetylcholine is bound to the acetylcholine receptor and it's being released by the neuron. Well, luckily we make a little enzyme, a protein called acetylcholinesterase. Acetylcholinesterase breaks apart ACH, or acetylcholine. When it breaks it apart, it gets released from the acetylcholine receptors. The acetylcholine receptors close, and that helps trigger uh, mechanisms that cause relaxation. We know this is important because if you block that enzyme with things like sarin gas or VX gas, it can actually block that enzyme. It blocks the ability of your muscle to relax because that acetylcholine signaling never turns off. And if your muscles won't relax, well, you can't do things like breathe, and that can actually kill you because your breathing is your muscle contracting and relaxing, contracting and relaxing. Okay, next, we're going to describe the mechanisms of muscle cell contraction in re and relaxation, including the role of muscle proteins and calcium. So we're actually going to delve deep into that muscle cell and look at a little bit of the proteins and the mechanisms that allow contraction. So again, acetylcholine triggers an action potential. An action potential is going to trigger calcium release. Calcium is going to cause our little contractile proteins to uh, interact. And this is actually a cardiac muscle cell, and this is showing waves of calcium within that cell, which then cause that little cell to contract. So calcium is the sort of bridge between the action potential and contraction. So if we look here again, this is a muscle cell, a myocyte. We're assuming that sodium is rushing in all along that cell membrane and the T-tubules, so that action potential spreads. Again, why? Because sodium is rushing in. We call the, um, the cell membrane the sarcolemma. The T-tubules are just extensions of that cell membrane deep into the cell because it's so big. What happens, the action potential actually triggers the SR, and the SR has little voltage-gated calcium channels. Again, the SR is this calcium storage site. So if you open these little voltage-gated calcium channels in the SR, calcium diffuses out into the cell cytoplasm, into the cell fluid. And so now we have really high calcium, or higher calcium, in our muscle cell, and that actually triggers the calcium. Oh, excuse me, the contraction. If you want to cause relaxation, you need to put that calcium back in the SR. And in that case, we got to go against diffusion, so we have to use calcium pumps. So the SR has calcium channels and calcium pumps. So we start with acetylcholine, we get an action potential, we release calcium, and then that causes contraction. If we want to cause relaxation, we've got to put the calcium away. Seems complex, but you can always pause and read. I have a lot of slides in here that have step-by-step -step mechanisms, so pause and, and check these out. Again, these are calcium waves inside a cardiac myocyte. So calcium is critical to getting a muscle cell to contract, whether cardiac, smooth muscle, or skeletal muscle.
So what does calcium do to cause contraction? And that's what we're going to cover next. It basically allows those little contractile proteins to interact. So we're going to see how, what the calcium does uh, once it gets released inside the cell. So increased calcium is going to be critical to contraction. So here's our little myocyte. We've got our SR, our sarcoplasmic reticulum, with stored calcium. The calcium gets released through cal voltage-gated calcium channels. Now we've got to look at the little contractile protein. So I'm drawing in myosin here and also actin. All right, so remember, actin and myosin make up the sarcomeres, which make up the myofibrils, which are all throughout. These bundles of actin and myosin are found throughout the inside of our muscle cell. All right, so we're going to zoom in and look at these little uh, actin and myosin molecules. So one of the things to notice is that when the muscle contracts, the myosin actually pulls on the actin, and basically these these sort of rigid proteins slide past each other. So that's what we're showing here. We're showing the myofibrils inside a muscle cell and how they sort of shorten and then they can relax. So we're going to zoom in on myosin and actin and look at some helper proteins that they have as well. So here we go. So now we're way zoomed into your muscle. We're looking at the actin and the myosin proteins. The myosin proteins have a cool little myosin head and it does cool stuff like grab other proteins. We have some helper proteins with the actin called tropomyosin which is a blocker protein and troponin which binds calcium. So good, we're finally mentioning calcium. So if calcium's not around, the tropomyosin blocker protein blocks and myosin can't grab onto actin and that's what it likes to do. So it wants to grab actin, but it can't because it's being blocked by tropomyosin. All right? um, and so we're in the relaxed state. No calcium yet, or low calcium. Okay, now we're going to release some calcium into our muscle cell, into the cytoplasm from the SR. Calcium binds to troponin. When calcium binds to troponin, it actually moves tropomyosin out of the way. And now the little myosin head can grab on. So check this out. So calcium binds to troponin all throughout the, um, throughout the muscle cell. Troponin swings tropomyosin out of the way. It physically helps move it. And it moves out of the way. And now the little myosin head, which also uses ATP to do all this cool stuff, grabs onto actin. It pulls actin. And it actually causes these actin molecules, these actin strands, to uh, move. All right, so that's what the little myosin head does. It grabs onto actin and then pulls it. Now it uses ATP to do this. It needs an ATP to let go, and then it uses ATP, and then it needs another one to let go and grab back on. And it's basically like a little molecular arm that pulls on actin. Whenever calcium's put away back in the SR, then the little myosin can't grab on anymore and contraction's over. So there's a good summary of the steps in muscle contraction. Again, you can pause it if you want. In terms of relaxation, what do we got to do? Well, we've got to put calcium away. When we put calcium away, calcium leaves troponin, tropomyosin goes back into the blocker position, and myosin heads can't grab on anymore. All right, so how do we put the calcium back in the SR? We pump it back. Uh, and also, the, the cell's not getting any more signals to release calcium from the SR. So calcium goes down in the cell, troponin moves tropomyosin, and the little myosin head can't grab on anymore. And so you're back to the relaxed state. Again, here's another good summary slide. You're welcome to pause it and read each of the steps related to um, muscle relaxation. We basically set the uh, stop releasing acetylcholine. We get the inside of the cell back to negative, put calcium away, and then actin and myosin no longer bind, and your muscle cell is relaxed. The final learning objective is to cover and describe ATP production and ATP use inside our muscle cells. So you, hopefully you remember how we make ATP. Glucose goes into our cell. Glucose is converted to pyruvate. When it's pyru uh, converted to pyruvate, we make some ATP. We call this process glycolysis. The pyruvate then is shuttled into the mitochondria. Sometimes it builds up to lactic acid. 
but most of it's going to go into our mitochondria along with oxygen and that's going to help produce through complex chemical reactions lots of ATP, some CO2 as well as some heat. So remember that ATP is cash that our cell can use. We also like to use fatty acids to shuttle those into the mitochondria which we can make lots of ATP as well. All right, sometimes we'll call that aerobic metabolism or oxidative phosphorylation. Just remember that that requires oxygen in the mitochondria. Glycolysis doesn't require oxygen, but makes far less ATP. So again, most of our cells need mitochondria to make enough ATP, and we're using glucose and fatty acids, and so when people talk about burning calories, they're talking about using nutrients inside their cells to generate ATP. Don't forget we make heat. So when your muscles are really active, your body heats up. Well, where do we use all that ATP? So we're making all this ATP from glycolysis and mitochondria. Well, one way we use, we use a lot of our ATP is simply in those pumps to pump sodium out of the cell and pump potassium back into the cell. Another way we use ATP is those um, the pumps in the SR, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, for them to pump calcium back into the SR for relaxation, actually we have to use ATP because we're going against diffusion. So that's a second source. The other source is the little myosin protein heads. The myosin protein heads, whenever they grab onto actin and then release and then grab back on and then release, they constantly use and break down ATP. So again, myosin uses ATP in order to do the job of contraction. So those are our three main sources of ATP use inside our muscle cells. And again, they can use a lot of ATP when you're really, really active. Breaks down the ATP to ADP and phosphate, and then it's used up. All right, that is the end. I will see you guys in class.